year is absolutely awesome. Um, you know, we were just out yesterday. Uh, I have two little boys at the house, so we have to kind of be creative uh, with our days and the approach to education and all that kind of stuff. So I had to take my youngest one out. And, uh, you know, we had warblers that were, you know, probably in Central America and South America, um, probably about a week or two ago. And now they were, you know, 15 feet above our heads. And my five-year-old and I just had, you know, a couple moments there watching these birds that just crossed the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and he can't quite understand that. But, uh, you know, at some, at some point he will. And, uh, um, you know, getting the kid started off that early um, doesn't, doesn't hurt anything, right? And it's uh, opening his eyes to uh, this amazing uh, world that's out there. So uh, we both got to see this fantastic black-threaded blue warbler singing right over our heads, you know, buzzing. Um, and uh, it's, it's such a crisp and contrasting, you know, colorful bird, uh, you know, that, that he actually, you know, reacted and uh, was excited to see it. Um, and not only did we get to see birds, which you know, if, if y'all have already taken my classes, that's, that's my thing, right, birds? Um, but we got to see a garter snake uh, while we were out in some ferns that we have um, in, our, in our woods. Um, and we also have to, got to see a, uh, a great snake and a copperhead eater, um, a black racer. Uh, so, you know, it's a snake that we've seen several times in our, in our yard. Um, we've, we've got a log pile or a couple of them in some uh, brush piles. And uh, this one was hanging out in a thicket of uh of blackberries that we have and it was just you know it, we, i thought it was a uh you know one of the blackberry um you know stems at, at first and you know it was black and uh i thought it might have been a piece of rubber but it actually ended up being a snake so uh you know this was just in in one morning um and uh just got to experience you know springtime in south carolina so it was just so cool um and hopefully um you know y'all be encouraged or uh, um you know, to, to do this kind of, um, or create, creating these habitats in your house, um, or on your property, uh, even though, you know, some of these are going, going to, um, support snakes. Um, they're going to support reptiles, they're going to support amphibians. Um, but you, when you think about, uh, all wildlife, they, they support all other wildlife, you know, think about how many snakes are bird food. Think about how many snakes are, you know, possum food or skunk food. So, um, hopefully you'll start thinking about this, uh, you know, during this presentation, but wildlife needs your help, right? Um, and if you do want to certify your yard, um, you can go to the National Wildlife Federation, um, and here's the website right here, here's the link, um, and certify it. You need to provide food, okay, um, on, your, on your property. You need to provide cover, okay, water, Sustainable gardening practices. You see, you see the rain barrel right there, um, and then place to raise young. So typically, when people are thinking about places to raise young, they're thinking about you know bird boxes. But you know, my my son yesterday, again the five year old, um, he uncovered a log or just rolled it over um, that that we have just sitting in our yard, and he found a little baby or a tiny egg. It looked like a jelly bean. So. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, what species it belonged to, but maybe a lizard um, or possibly a snake, right? Um, so, you know, don't just think about bird boxes. Um, we'll we'll kind of get in, into everything um, during this presentation. Um, you know, think about brush piles. Uh, think about rock piles, log piles. Uh, those are all places to raise young. Um, I don't know if you recognize this little frog right here, but that's a uh, green tree frog um, just kind of sitting in a PVC pipe that we have in our yard uh, vertically. And, um, you know, we have five install, installed in our prairie area. And right now, four out of the five uh, have uh, tree frogs in them. Um, so just another kind of a neat way that, uh, that you can support wildlife on your property. Um, uh, here, I don't know, there's some blue lines that are being created on the screen. I'm not sure where that's coming from. So if y'all can see that, um, I apologize, but I don't know where that's coming from. Um, so uh, I, I have this, I have this uh, lantana on here with the Gulf fritillary butterfly. Um, I have that uh, under the food uh, section just because, you know, we don't think that, you know, nectar is a food source, right? And when you think about our moths and butterflies, um, 
you know, they, they go to that. And, and then our wasps and bees, you know, they're, they need, you know, those, those nectar sources, those flowers uh, in, the, in the yard. And then below the Gulf fritillary, obviously, I have the, the northern flicker here. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a platform feeder. There's many, many types of feeders that you can put out. And we covered that during one of the bird classes. Um, but there's hopper feeders, there's cylindrical feeders. And then, again, there's a platform feeder like this and there's suet. Um, so, you know, hopefully you have uh, one or two of these um, out of the five that are, that are listed here. Um, but sustainable gardening also, you know, is uh, re reducing or eliminating herbicides or, or pesticides from your, from your yard. So if you want to certify your, your property, just go to nwf.org and uh, just go to, you know, Certified Wildlife Habitat and uh, just check the, check the boxes um, with what you have done. And if you um, have achieved all five, you know, categories, uh, you can, you can uh, certify your, your yard. And then uh, some of the money that, um, that you uh, spend to get your yard cert certified comes directly to South Carolina Wildlife Federation. So what does your neighborhood look like? Um, you know, that neighborhood on the right hand side, uh, it's actually not, not too, too bad, right? It's, it's got some trees at least. Um, you know, it, it makes me think about some of the neighborhoods that are created, you know, here in South Carolina, you know, the brand new ones. Um, oftentimes we see one created and it's just houses and all the trees have, every single, you know, one has been cleared. So at least this one has trees, right? There's some, there's some foraging um, opportunities for uh, insects and amphibians. Uh, reptiles and, and birds there, um, and some maybe some cover for some mammals here and there. Um, but you know, I do see quite a bit of turf grass. And whenever we think about turf grass in the United States, um, you know, uh, ask yourself how many acres of turf turf grass exist. Um, and if you read about it, uh, I know Audubon and uh, maybe the American Bird um, Association did a study on this. And there's about around 40 million acres of uh, turf grass here in the United States. And it's about the size of Georgia. And I always say, you know, if it was just Georgia, you know, uh, that would be okay. It would be bad for Georgia, right? Um, but the rest of the United States would, would be in pretty good shape. But the problem is, you know, this turf grass is uh, just spread all over the United States and it causes fragmentation. And one thing that most wildlife does not like is, uh, you know, habitat fragmentation. So uh, it causes a real big problem um, for, for wildlife. But what you can do, you know, think about these houses that you see in this picture right over here. Um, if each one, you know, tried to uh, mimic their, th this picture down here on the bottom left and install some taller grasses, more shrubs, um, you know, think about the, the connections, the, the yards being connected and, you know, kind of eliminating that fragmentation that now exists in that neighborhood. So, you know, think about your neighborhood, what it looks like, and um, think about your neighbors and maybe, um, you know, getting a plan in place and, uh, you know, kind of creating uh, more, more of a, a property or a yard that looks like the yard on the bottom left. Um, so we were talking about sustainable um, gardening practices, you know, that, that picture on the top left, uh, just think about how many, how much uh, pesticide that they, they need to keep that yard looking like that. Think about the herbicide that they need to keep the yard looking like that. Um, and, you know, after a big rain, uh, think about where that stuff goes. Um, you know, is it good for the fish? Is it good for, um, you know, mollusks? Is it good for uh, amphibians? Um, is it is it good for all the wildlife, right? Um, so you know, just just kind of something to think about. Um, you know, think about your neighborhood and and maybe you know some ideas to improve the habitat for for wildlife. Hey, if you wouldn't mind um, closing out of your share screen and resharing because those blue lines are still popping up. Um, technical difficulties, everybody. Um, but while Jay is working on his screen, I know we, we had a question from Don earlier in the chat box um, asking, as a part of your wildlife habitat, does your water in your yard need to be running? And the answer to that is no. And Jay's going to go back into those categories and explain that further. But something like a bird bath is really all you need um, to get that yard certified. And then Scott also had a question about the PVC pipe 
use for the frogs. I don't know if you're going to get into that further in the presentation, but um, no, I can go ahead and answer that. Yeah, he wanted to know how high and and um, what. Let's see. It says, "What DIA do you use with your frog PVC pipe? How tall?" Um. So I think these were four foot pieces. I could be wrong. They might have been three. Um, and I probably pounded them in about a foot. So there's a, there's around two to three feet exposed. Um, and I believe they are one inch in diameter. Um, I think one or one and a half, but I know um, Wingard's Nursery is starting to sell some and they have kind of cool frog designs like frog, you know, the, 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 the skin, you know, of some of these uh, frogs either in the United States or, you know, tropical species. Um, they they're, they have a design on the outside of them, so they kind of look uh, they, they look pretty neat. But I know at Wingard's in Lexington, um, they're starting to sell some of these things. Um, but if you're if you're not you know wanting to purchase uh, one from somewhere, yeah, just uh, I think one to one and a half PVC pipe or diameter, and then uh, about three two to three feet exposed, um, you know, out outside of the ground or above the ground uh, will will do. And again, I've had uh, four out of my five, um, you know, being being utilized by the frogs. Pretty neat. Any more questions, Shannon? Nope, you're good to go. Okay, okay. So guys, uh, you know, the if you've been on the bird classes uh, before, I've talked about host plants and native plants uh, both times. Uh, my wife is in sales. She calls on doctors all over the state and she says she has to say the same things to doctors seven times before uh, they start uh, <laughs> listening to her, right? Um, and actually doing uh, what she's uh, hopefully wanting, the, wanting them to do. So uh, this is only the third or fourth time. So, you know, y'all just uh, join me another three or four times uh, and that'll make seven. And uh, hopefully if you haven't already, you're going to start uh, installing some native plants. Uh, but I'm going to talk about them again. Uh, first, they're beautiful, right? Uh, second, you know, they're supposed to be here. Um, yeah, they, they evolved with everything here, which I think is kind of cool. And uh, thirdly, um, uh, gosh, look at all those uh, caterpillars that they support. And y'all probably seen that picture before, or some of y'all have, but there are nine caterpillar species right there. And we found those during a kind of a slowish bird walk at the South Carolina Botanical Garden um, at their uh, pollinator garden, uh, where their uh, one of their education centers is. Um, so the birding was a, a little bit slow, so we just kind of started looking at the leaves around the botanical garden and found some amazing, amazing uh, caterpillars. So, you know, there were pipe vine caterpillars. That yellow one that you see is a spiny rose caterpillar it's for a uh, moth. Uh, Gulf fritillary monarch. Um, you know, all, all sorts of caterpillars in, in just, you know, we probably walked around for an hour and a half and found these guys. Uh, so what that is, is a lot of food, right? Um, not just for birds, but for reptiles, some amphibians. Um, you know, when, when you install native plants, you're going to get caterpillars. Um, and not only are you going to get caterpillars, but you're also going to get other arthropods like spiders. Um, and even though I'm not a huge spider fan, uh, they kind of give me the heebie-jeebies. There are some beautiful ones out there that I just, you know, will sit there and admire because they're, they're, they're kind of stunning, right? Um, but, you know, those, those spiders and, and other insects are, are all there, you know, either eating the plant or, you know, um, preying upon, uh, you know, those, the, the other insects there. Um, and then you start thinking about the, the larger things that are eating those insects. And then you start thinking about the birds um, and then the snakes and, you know, it's all connected. Um, so, you know, you can get some beauty uh, from, these, from these flowers, obviously, from these plants. Uh, but think about, you know, all the other stuff that's going on in these. But um, here, here are, you know, a few of my favorite species uh, to, to have in my yard um, and to have, you know, here in the southeast. Uh, goldenrod is, is one of the best plants that you can plant. It's a host plant to over 100 different uh, species of uh, Lepidoptera, so moths and butterflies. Um, Aster, um, New England is just a, just a variety, right? There's, there's many others. Um, but Aster is a host plant to, I think, over 100 um, species as well. And then Joe Pye weed. Um, you know, it's a, it's a host plant, I believe, to um, at least a few dozen, if not, you know, over 40 or 50 um, moths and butterflies. 
Um, but those uh, flowers, boy, do they really attract a lot of um, a lot of pollinators. Uh, so, you know, those are three of my favorite ones. Um, if you're looking for more, you know, the uh, our website has a really nice list of uh, native plants uh, that you can install in your uh, in your garden, you know, to to attract these butterflies and moths, you know, to the actual flowers, but also to help them out um, when they're when they're young, when they're caterpillars, uh, providing food in the form of leaves, right? Okay, we've got a couple of questions. Um, yep. Kia Jackson wants to know, are wild blackberries a native host plant? She's got some running in her backyard and is debating whether to keep them or cut them. Yeah, so gosh, you know, if you don't mind, uh, you know, our, our blackberry species, keep, keep them up. Um, you, you know, there has to be something out there that uses it as a host plant. Um, I don't have a number for you. But it, it did evolve here, right? So there, there has to be, um, you know, a moth or butterfly that's going to lay its egg on there so the caterpillar can eat it. Uh, what I love about blackberries uh, is the cover that it uh, provides. Um, I was just talking about that black racer uh, snake that we found in our yard yesterday. That was in our blackberry. Um, we, we have a couple areas that have blackberry, uh, you know, uh, brambles or um, just thickets. And uh, it was sitting in there and, and I've seen, you know, pictures of black racers eating copperheads. Um, so uh, I like to have those in my yard, especially with two young kids, right? Um, but think about this too. Um, not only is it habitat, you know, for cool things like that, but I've seen summer tanagers in late summer um, or midsummer, I guess, um, swoop down and pick blackberries off of, uh, straight off of the vine like we would do, right? Except uh, they go in mouth first. <laughs> uh, I don't advise that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, they provide, it provides all sorts of food. Whether or not it's a host plant, um, it's still an important plant, but I would put a lot of money down that, that it is a host plant just because it evolved with all of our insects here. And Jay, we've got two more questions. So Kathy said, you know, blackberry can be a pretty invasive plant just because it eradicates so quickly. Do you have any suggestions for people who don't want blackberry to be in their yard overtaking it? Um, Actually, and while before you answer, Madison, who's joining us from the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, mm -hmm. did black raspberry. As a native alternative. So there you go. Our chat comments came through. There we go. Um, one more question for you. Greg wanted to know um, in regards to the caterpillar species, is there a caterpillar that chickadees prefer to feed their young? Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure. Will, will they take one of these, you know, uh, spiny rose uh, caterpillars uh, and, and feed it to the, to the young because they, 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 they can sting, um, you know. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. Um, but if you if you if you watch them, they're a lot of times they're they're taking these little green caterpillars, the little brown ones. Um, you know, the the thing is just just providing as many native plants as possible is, is what I would say. I, I don't know if they prefer one or over the other. Um, just like human species, they they might like something you know better than than you know something else that's out there. But uh, just have as many host plants as possible. And we talked about, you know, the, the trees that are out there, the oaks and the maples and the hickories and, um, you know, the, the hackberries, you know, that provide a ton of, of caterpillars. Um, so just have a mixture out there, not only with your trees, um, but with your shrubs um, and, and with your perennials. And, and the chickadees will, will have all, all, they'll have more than they, than they need. Can I, can I move on to the next slide now? You can move on. Okay, okay great. All right, so um, these are just a few uh, species that you might see, um, just to kind of stay on this uh, just for a second longer. Uh, so you can see the eggs there on that leaf. Um, you know, this is uh, the, the top right is a viceroy uh, caterpillar that, uh, you know, looks like a bird dropping um, at, at one of the end stages on a, uh, of, its, of its life as a caterpillar. Um, and then, you know, before I got into birding, um, I had no idea you know about the variety of butterflies that we have or moths uh, and when I when I moved back to South Carolina um, you know after living in Pittsburgh for five years um, you know I 
just stumbled upon a rosy maple moth there at the lower left hand side and that's a moth that is native to South Carolina um, and is one of the the most stunning species of animal that we that we have um, you know I've led a couple bird walks and we've we've seen one of these and it's always it's always fun for me you know to have a group of 15 20 adults just go whoa and uh, you know you, you see that wonder in their eyes that they that they probably had whenever they were kids uh, but a little moth can do that, you know, uh, a, a yellow and pink uh, moth can do that. And uh, for me, it's a real treat to, treat to see uh, somebody, somebody surprised. Uh, but, you know, without seeing that bird uh, 10 years ago, um, and which got me to look, you know, um, deeper into, into our planet um, and, and all the species here, um, you know, I, I probably, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't have known that that exists. Um, and then a, a few other uh, butterflies that we have here in malls. We have the Luna moth at uh, the top left. Uh, we have the Monarch on the, the top right. We have the Gulf Fritillary on the passion flower vine uh, and the, on the passion flower. Um, and that's the host plant or one of the host plants for the Gulf Fritillary. And then we have the zebra swallowtail there at the bottom, bottom left. And then we have our state uh, butterfly, the, the Eastern tiger swallowtail, the yellow and black one with a little bit of blue um, there on the back of its wings. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you install host plants, you get to see a lot more color in your yard, uh, not only in the form of moths and butterflies, but uh, think about all the birds that are going to uh, be eating some of those caterpillars. And here they are. Uh, right now, guys, we are in the middle of an awesome spring migration. Uh, just yesterday when I took my son out just for a, for a little while in the morning, I think we were out for about an hour and a half. Uh, we saw, let's see, five, six of these. So six out of the nine that are here, we were able to see the yellow bill cuckoo on the bottom right, the black and white warbler center, you know, bottom, the black throated blue warbler, bottom left, the American red star, Baltimore Oriole, and the white eyed vireo. Um, you know, think about my yard and think about it not having, you know, all the native oaks and all the native maples and hickories. Uh, think about it not having the native blueberries and other and other things. Um, would those birds be be here, you know, foraging? Probably not. Um, so, you know, if you love birds and you want to see more birds, install native plants. Um, get that get that caterpillar and insect factory going um, and you'll and you'll see more of these. Um, I'm not going to hang out uh, on this page too, too long because we've already um, covered birds in, in our previous two. Um, but if you do have any questions uh, about birds, you know, we can, you can ask them at the end of the presentation. Um, but viburnum is a fantastic plant to plant. Uh, spice bush, if, uh, if you want the spice bush um, swallowtail, you know, in your yard, plant some spice bush and you uh, can probably attract that. Native blueberries are fantastic to plant. Uh, you, can, you can find all sorts of caterpillars on those. And uh, I know did this blueberry support about almost 300, I think around 288 um, uh, moth and butterfly species. Um, so, you know, it's a fantastic uh, plant to plant. And you have a little bit of false indigo in here too. But uh, native plants, guys. So this is cover, but we're, we're talking about blackberries, right? <laughs> cover and food. So one of my favorites, uh, when we're talking about cover, okay, uh, is American holly, but you're also providing food. Um, and not only are you providing food for, for birds, you know, in the form of berries, but you're also providing food in the form of, you know, uh, caterpillars. So the Henry's Elfin caterpillar, uh, which I've, I've tried to find on, on you know, holly, but I, I haven't found it yet. I know I'm going to get it one time. But, uh, you know, it's, you think about the holly leaf, it, it has the spikes and it's thick. Um, there's actually caterpillars that, that you know, eat it, um, which is pretty, pretty darn impress, impressive. Um, so great cover in the form of, you know, uh, uh, the, the foliage on that tree, um, but it also does provide the food. We, we talked about blackberries already. Um, but look at all that food right there um, and think about all the cover as well that 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 that, um, you know, uh, is providing on your property. If if you do have the space for it, it can, you know, it can tend to take over certain areas. Um, but if you have the space for it, you know, why not? And then American Beautyberry. Uh, you know, it has great cover uh, once, you know, this this time of year it has, uh, you know, its leaves. 
uh, in the fall time, it produces a lot of berries. And when you think about our, our thrush kind of coming through uh, on their way to their southern uh, wintering grounds, you know, think about the wood thrush, uh, think about the Swainson's thrush, maybe gray cheek thrush. Uh, they'll, they'll forage on those berries. Um, I've even say, seen um, on two occasions black-throated blue warblers in the fall time uh, while they're, you know, heading down south as well, uh, eat um, some of the berries there of the American beautyberry. So, uh, you know, uh, three, three great plants to plant in your, in your house if you, if you haven't done so already. And Jay, why is cover important? Well, um, well one, it, it provides a place, let's, let's just go back to that black racer. Guess what it was doing? It was, it was hunting. Um, and so it provides a place for, you know, predator or prey to kind of hide, right? They try to hide at least but it also has, uh, it provides a place for predators to hunt and look for prey. Um, you know, you think about birds. If, uh, if I had a bird bath, um, or if I had, I guess, you know, more than one on my property, I might would put one near blackberry um, or maybe near an American holly bush because those birds want some cover for safety, right? So if there's a Cooper's hawk or a sharp shin hawk in the area um, and, you know, uh, which forages on, which feeds on birds uh, primarily, uh, you know, you want to kind of offer these birds uh, a, a little bit of cover, right? So uh, the cover is going to provide safety um, and it's going to provide a, a hunting ground um, and it's going to provide a lot of food. So covers covers fantastic. And it, and it also provides in, in all of that uh, a place to, uh, for some, for some species to reproduce. So water features, I, th I think somebody had, had mentioned something about a water feature earlier, but, um, you know, water features can be super, super, super simple. Um, you know, you can, you can do it with an upside down trash can lid if you want. Um, you know, so most people think about bird baths, right? Um, so they're, they're, very, they're very good at, tra at attracting, uh, you know, birds and, and multiple species of birds. Um, you know, a little tip, if you want to see even more birds during migration or during the summertime, uh, if, it, if it's dry, um, just put a sprinkler on, you know, around your bird bath, you know, for maybe an hour if you, if you can or 30 minutes or so. Um, and, you know, those birds will be attracted to that motion and uh, you'll, you'll get them to come by and, and take a bath and you might see some really cool species that, that you haven't seen before. Um, but if you can put something in there um, uh, that, that, you know, gets the water to move, uh, birds will, will come to moving water more than they will just, you know, uh, water that's just kind of sitting there still. Um, if you have the resources, uh, gosh, you can make some really, really nice uh, water features now. Um, there's a lot of landscape companies that will install, you know, I've seen, you know, basically man-made creeks going through someone's yard. Uh, but if you could, if you have the financial resources to, to do so, boy, you're going to see a lot of critters in your yard if you can, uh, if you can do that. Not only, you know, uh, birds, but, um, you know, all sorts of uh, uh, amphibians and reptiles and, uh, you know, uh, critters that are going to be utilizing that water source. So depending on your, you know, your resources, um, you know, that'll, that'll kind of dictate what kind of uh, water source that, that you provide. But bird baths is it, what, what usually people think of, but you know, these little uh, vernal ponds, well, I guess this isn't a vernal pond, this is, uh, you know, uh, land, landscape uh, in, in their yard, but um, these ponds are gonna hold even more if you can do it, but you can even create a, a small, you know, seasonal, seasonal pond in, in your yard if you have the uh, property for it. Uh, shallow shallow bins are, uh, you know, we I had mentioned the uh, trash can lid earlier. Um, you know, this this works just as well, right? Um, and you can see the cover right there for frogs and toads uh, in the broken pot. So a great little spot for frogs to to get some water. Maybe even a snake, you know, can can uh, fit over that lip and and take a sip of water um, if if you're okay with that. But uh, you know, when you when you create things like this, you're going to create you know uh, habitat or homes for something really cool, like a Coates gray tree frog, or you know, right here. Um, well, I guess I'm holding that one, but my son found it. Uh, my five-year-old, uh, he found it in in uh, in our backyard. It's a barking tree frog, one of the prettiest frogs that you'll see. Uh, here in South Carolina, um, and in my opinion, you know, 
in, in anywhere in the world. I mean, it is just a stunning, stunning frog to see and relatively big in, in terms of tree frogs. Um, and then you have up here, the top right, you have the red shouldered hawk uh, and it's eating a frog. Um, and just yesterday while we were out, we saw a red shouldered hawk fly above us, above the canopy, and I saw two frog legs, you know, just hanging out from its talons. So, you know, when you create water sources, remember, we're, we're not just creating water sources to, you know, attract the, uh, attract the animals just for our pleasure, but they fit into the ecosystem, right? Um, so you're allowing other things to, to survive um, and, and to forage um, and to feed their young by, by uh, creating all these habitats on your property. Um, and then I have here at the bottom left or right, I have leave the leaves and I have a picture of a screech owl and why, why in the world would I, uh, you know, have a picture of a screech owl um, under that caption. But, you know, when, whenever we think about a, a little screech owl, it, it eats a lot of worms. And so, you know, the more, the more leaves we have, the more worms we're going to have, the more grubs we're going to have. Uh, there's even caterpillars that feed on the fallen leaves of, you know, oaks and other species. Um, so think about all those uh, insects that you're supporting. Uh, watch a brown thrasher uh, feed. Watch an eastern towhee feed. Um, they are, you know, going through that leaf litter, you know, looking for all these um, um, nutrition, you know, packed uh, snacks, you know. So if, if there is a part of your yard that you can just kind of uh, leave untouched or, you know, just put the leaves or leave the leaves, uh, please do so and, and just watch it. And I think you'll, you'll enjoy what, what you see. Um, and we, he actually found that barking tree frog under some leaves, you know, near a, near a old stump, which, uh, you know, old, old stumps are great because they have a lot of places, you know, for critters to hide. Jay, we've got a lot of great comment activity happening in our chat box, but one question, especially regarding certified wildlife habitats, if you've got a pond in your yard, does that mean you also need to add a water feature? Is that pond going to keep you good to go? I think you are, you know, you got a pond, you are good to go. So yeah, if you're, if you live on Lake Murray um, or one of the lakes in South Carolina or North Carolina or Virginia, you know, uh, you, you can have a bird bath, um, you know, if you want to you know, bring the birds a little bit closer or whatever, you know, wildlife you want to see. But no, once you have a pond or, or if you live on the lake or <laughs> of course the ocean, you know, you're, you're good or, or a creek, you know, for that matter. So no, you don't have to un unless you just, you know, wanted to supplement that. Very good. Good. Um, all right. So y'all, let's talk about brush piles for a little bit, right? And so I, I talk about these even in my bird classes. Um, I, I always ask, you know, who's who's going to install a brush pile on their property? And I usually don't get a lot of a lot of hands being raised. Um, so I, I kind of we would love for that to to change a little bit. Um, you know, brush piles uh, offer so much cover um, for for wildlife, so much protection, so much food. Uh, think about that brush pile. Uh, decomposing. Think about all the the beetles and the grubs that are that are going to be um, you know eating you know uh, the the wood in there and the and the leaves. Um, so you know we we look at a picture of a possum here of a little skunk. Um, you know those those are you know a couple of the mammals that that will utilize a, a brush pile. And remember when we're when we're thinking about these, um, think about a skunk. Um, being bird food um, or you know other other animal food, um, I've seen many pictures of possums being eaten by great horned owls and barred owls. Uh, so you know when we create a brush pile, we're not just creating a home for for these guys or, or, or a place for them to at least temporarily seek refuge. Um, you know we're, we're supporting these species. Uh, the, the numbers should be better. You know. Um, which is going to support more numbers of, of other species. So if you can, you know, a, a brush pile is an amazing place or uh, an amazing um, feature to add onto your property. And these are just a couple of brush piles on my property. I think I have six, but I, but I also, we, we have about three acres. So, you know, I'm, I'm able to kind of, you know, create, you know, more than, than you know, a, a typical person would in a, in a regular, you know, type of neighborhood. Um, but, you know, we found the eastern box turtle around them. Um, I know on, in one of my bird classes, I, I said I've, I've seen three wren species, you know, flitting around the um, brush piles in our, on our property, the Carolina wren, the house wren, and the winter wren. Um, 
And then, you know, obviously the, probably the main reason people don't want to install, um, you know, brush piles are, are snakes. Um, and, you know, we've, we've been in Chapin for five and a half years now at, on our property. And, and I, I just said, we have, I think around six brush piles and, and we've never seen a copperhead. Um, I know they're around, um, and I'm, I'm sure they have seen us, but, uh, they have great camouflage and, uh, we just, we haven't seen them, but we have had eight species of snakes on our property. Uh, all of them, uh, have been non-venomous, um, at this point. And we've seen two that actually eat a venomous snakes. Uh, one being the, the king snake that you see at the bottom of the, this picture, and then the black racer, of course. Um, now, a lot of people will think uh, that that's a uh, eastern rat snake. It's a juvenile right there, the one in the in the center, center left, I guess. A lot of people will think that's a copperhead, and and uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of those get killed every year. But um, you know, through snake classes and and through some other things that we're we're trying to do um, or we're do, doing, hopefully, hopefully, we'll we'll be able to um, have people avoid that uh, in the future. Um, but you know, brush piles are fantastic. If there's a, a thing that I, I could get everybody to do on their property or, um, it, it would be installing a brush pile. Uh, and then, you know, opposite of a brush pile is leaving a, a piece of your property just bare. And that bottom right picture, I don't know if y'all can see it or not, but there's tiny holes in there and, and a couple of them have little huts. Um, and those are, those are for bees, um, bumblebees. Um, I'm not a, you know, a, a bee person, so I don't know what species it is, but, uh, for about four years now, they've, they've, uh, they've lived there and they, every, uh, April and May, they, these holes just magically appear one morning. And, uh, you know, we, we have dozens of, uh, bees living there. And, uh, you know, I, I keep that place intentionally, uh, clear of any kind of leaves, um, or debris. You see some, uh, pine straw there. Uh, but that's that's about as much you know that will that will uh, be there um, and because I want those bees to to return every single year. Um, so you know uh, we're going from brush piles, which is a huge mound of of debris, to to, to nothing at all. So uh, just kind of experiment with your yard and, and see what happens when you when you manipulate it a little bit. And Jay, I know you're not watching the comments section, but you would be very pleased to know that a lot of our participants do have brush piles. So, all right. Yeah. All right. Glad to hear. Um, and I know, you know, uh, there's, there's probably at some point somebody's be like, or uh, we'll, we'll say, Hey, I've got a brush pile and I saw a copperhead around it. No doubt about it. Um, I'm sure every single one of my brush piles has had a copperhead in it or around it at some point. Uh, we've, we've just never seen them. Um, but, uh, you know, they're, they're food as well. And, and they, uh, they fit into the ecosystem. Um, you know, very, very nicely and, and they should be here. Um, so other things, so log piles uh, and rock piles, uh, you know, beetles are one of the most fascinating insects in, in my opinion and, and my youngest son absolutely loves them. Um, you know, we found the stag beetle that you see on the top right um, at Congaree Creek Heritage Preserve during a bird walk. And from what I've read, I think it takes them about five years. Um, uh, to, to develop, you know, uh, into that beetle. So they need a really, really large uh, tree to decompose. Um, so while it is a, you know, a grub, it, it has something to eat. And so, you know, think about leaving logs. Uh, that, that insect, um, as far as I've read, is it's in pretty darn steep decline, um, the stag beetle, and it's an amazing insect to find. Um, and, you know, maybe we can help that out by, uh, you know, leaving some of the, some of the dead trees that fall in our yard, um, or at least cutting them up and, and maybe piling them someplace. Uh, you know, there's, there's a friend of mine who's, uh, whose father owns around 70 acres in, in Chapin and uh, beautifully manicured 70 acres. And there is not one tree that is on the ground in the uh, wooded area. Uh, and it's because the, 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 the owner's wife wanted him to take all the, uh, the logs out because they, they didn't look right, uh, or she didn't like the way it looked. So think about, think about, uh, how that affects the wildlife, uh, you know, uh, from the, from the smallest, you know, beetle or, you know, caterpillar to, to the, to the largest mammal that might, that might be foraging around there just because, you know, someone wants, uh, wants those logs out because they don't look nice. Um, 
so you know the there's a so the stag beetle is the top one fantastic bug insect and then you've got the eastern hercules uh beetle right there it's kind of the creamy white one with the black spots another large beetle and then you have a cool beetle called a triceratops beetle uh on the on the right hand side and that's on my uh, son's uh, wrist right there uh, but they need decomposing uh, material so think about those log piles um, and not only will, will you get beetles and other cool things, but you'll, you'll get some snakes, obviously, again, and you have a little decays brown snake right down there, and it'll utilize the, the, um, the rock pile and the log pile. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they max out at about 13 inches. So if you're a 13 inch snake, uh, guess what you are for a lot of creatures, right? You're going to be food. So, uh, you know, create this is, this is feeding wildlife in, in, in other forms, right? Not, not just bird feeders um, and, and seeds. You're, you're feeding snakes, toads, frogs, uh, grubs, beetles, uh, all sorts of things. So log piles Dave, and rock piles. We've got a great question from Greg. He wanted to know when, um, if a pine falls, should it be left where it is or would it be better to have it chopped up and put into piles? I mean, if you can, if you can leave it where it is, you know, that's, that's nature's design, right? Um, if you can leave it where it is, you know, that's, that's totally fine, uh, depending on what your, what your property looks like. You know, if it's in your front yard and it falls across your turf grass, um, you know, maybe, maybe you might want to move it. But, you know, if it just falls in the, in the woods, um, I, I leave mine, you know, where, where they lay. Um, now, if I want actually to... just corrected. So that is a great answer for trees, which still stands, but he just corrected and said pine cones. Pine cones. Oh, um, no, I, th I think having them, you know, uh, just, just lie where they fall is, is totally fine. Now, if you make a pine cone mound, uh, it's going to provide probably, you know, uh, more cover um, to, to something, you know, something's going to uh, squeeze in there. Um, so that's, you know, uh, something about, you know, I guess creating habitats on your property. Some of it is just, it, it, experimenting right um so how about this greg you make some mounds of pine cones and you get back with us in a couple of years and tell us what you find <laughs> and take some pictures um no, no one's ever asked me that but that's a that's that's it's a cool idea and i'm sure it's going to provide some habitat you know for for some creatures no doubt about it all right and i'm just going to drive just like the host plant point i'm just going to kind of talk about snakes a little bit longer. Um, because again, when we're creating log piles and, and rock piles and brush piles, uh, we're gonna support, you know, not, not only mammals and, and amphibians and other things, but we're gonna be supporting reptiles, right? And snakes. Um, so a, one of my friends uh, sent me a text message the other day with, uh, it was the picture on the, on the bottom, bottom left. And I said, oh my gosh, is that a, it looks like a, uh, corn snake right a red rat snake uh so a corn snake and she said yes I said is, is it still living she said no um and she just wanted me to ID it and she said what happened she was outside and uh her neighbor was outside and some guy came uh riding up the road in a truck and there was the snake that was sitting on her driveway and he stopped and um said it was a water moccasin and now this is you know uh, right right by Lake Murray on the south side of Lake Murray so he got out said said it was a real water moccasin and, and he killed it and then she you know sent me a picture um you know this snake is in decline the 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 corn snake um you know habitat loss is has impacted it greatly but uh you know it's probably one of the more common ones that's that's killed because people think it's a it's a copperhead and obviously this fella you know admittedly said it was a uh, said it was a um water moccasin right um, you know, and water moccasins, uh, I've said this before, but DNR is, uh, as far as we know, has never reported one on Lake Murray and these people weren't too far from Lake Murray. So it's, it's all about just, uh, you know, um, becoming educated about, you know, these snakes that are out there, but, you know, a red, a red rat snake or a corn snake, whatever you want to call it, you know, they're going to eat a lot of, a lot of mammals. They're probably going to eat some birds. Um, you know, as, if you if you handle them, will they bite you? Probably, um, but they're they're non venomous, um, and you know they're they're a part of our world, right? Um, the one on the top left is a water moccasin, um, and the one at the bottom right is a uh, you know a, a mature you know um, a corn snake. The one at the bottom left is a is an immature. 
So you can see that the water moccasin and the corn snake really, really don't look too, too much alike, right? And, um, you know, hopefully, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get into that neighborhood and see if we can do a snake class one, one, one day and hopefully, uh, <laughs> hopefully that fellow will come. Um, and then I also have a picture of a, of a gorgeous copperhead, you know, uh, just, 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 you know, either, either sunning itself or, um, you know, it looks like it's on a, on a dirt road right there. Um, but just gorgeous species. They belong here. And, and I hope, um, I hope you guys will, uh, if you don't have a brush pile or, or log pile, rock pile, we'll, we'll consider doing it and just learn your, learn, learn your snakes. If you're, if you're afraid of them and, um, you know, we have about 40 snake species here in South Carolina, only six of them are, are venomous and only in certain parts are you even going to get all six species. Um, and, uh, you know, our number two tick controller in South Carolina is a, is a timber rattlesnake. Um, I think they eat around 1,200 or so, uh, around 1,000 ticks a year. Our number one tick, tick eater is a, is a possum. I think they eat around four to 5,000 ticks a year. Um, so think about them, you know, being tick controllers. Think about the, you know, the rat snakes that we have, everything that eats these small mammals that, that carry ticks. Uh, they're, they're tick controllers and, uh, you know, one more time, they are food for wildlife. So um, when you think about an eastern rat snake, uh, you know, possibly laying around 20 eggs, those eggs hatch and they're, they're tiny, tiny snakes that are food for, you know, a lot of wildlife. So we talked about certifying your community uh, at the beginning. Um, so Greer is, uh, they just registered and, and hopefully, you know, relatively soon, um, they'll, they'll become a, a, an actual registered uh, certified uh, community habitat. Um, and that, you know, gets the community engaged with local libraries and schools and businesses and churches and all sorts of homeowners um, and, you know, companies and organizations in that community to kind of all come together and, and celebrate nature and, and uh, you know, do things for the environment that are beneficial. Um, so we have a lot of information on our website about it. If you, if you want to uh, talk to me about it, just shoot me an email and I'll talk to you more about how you can certify your community, you know, as a, uh, as a certified habitat. Um, the WAIT program, Wildlife and Industry Together, we have uh, large corporations uh, here in South Carolina that have quite a few acres of property. Some of them have, you know, over a thousand acres, um, you know, property. So they do things on their property, they support us financially, and they, then they also educate, you know, the community as well. And that's all a part of being in the WAIT program. So you know, uh, large businesses are doing it, communities are, are doing it, um, certifying their property. Um, you can do it too as a, as a homeowner, or uh, you don't even have to own a home. If you have an apartment and you have a little patio, you can do it too. You can provide, you know, all these five, the, the five elements that we talked about um, and, and get it certified. So I've, th this is just one of my favorite quotes that I, that I come uh, that I came across, uh, you know, not too, too long ago, but it says in the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand, and we will un understand only what we are taught. Uh, so like that fellow that just knew that, that juvenile um, corn snake was a, uh, a water moccasin, um, you know, boy, I would love to get him in, in one of our classes. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's just getting out there and, and reaching all these people. Um, but there's multiple ways to do it. Um, you know, we have the pro birder classes, uh, we have the master naturalist class. A top right this is our women's outdoor retreat where we where we reach over 200 women, you know, each year. Um, we love educating children. We started getting into schools this year, and I think we were probably going to reach around 600 kids, um, but obviously I had to put a stop to that um, due to the circumstances. Um, but hopefully next year, um, you know, when things uh, get back to normal, you know, hopefully we'll see those hundreds of kids. If, if not, you know, my, my goal is to see around a thousand or two each, each year. Um, and just, you know, just reaching your, that's my child there at the center with the, with the barking uh, tree frog, but just getting you to go out there with your grandkids, with your kids, and just getting out into nature. Um, again, you don't have to have you know, three acres or 300 acres, you can, you can do it, you know, on a 20th of an acre. You just have to have the right, the right setup, right? 
um, talking about uh, con conservation and nature. You know, this is a, a group of friends uh, that my mom has uh, and at the, at the top left. And we sat down and, and had, some, uh, had some wine and some, some cheese. And we talked about conservation. We talked about the birds. We talked about, you know, native plants. Uh, I've known them for 40 years now. And not once have they ever talked about that. So it's just, it's just kind of getting out there and, and talking about this stuff uh, to reach as many people, um, you know, as, as we can. Um, you know, I think nature will be a little bit better off if, if we do that. All right, so what, what can you do? Um, you create a backyard habitat focusing on native plants, okay? Uh, maybe less mowed lawn. Uh, brush piles, we've, we've kind of covered big time here. Uh, leave por portions of your yard untouched, all right? Remember, leave the leaves if you can and let things grow wild if you can. Uh, install nest boxes, um, they're fantastic. Uh, and uh, install a water source. Um, if you're looking for projects, uh, look up the Carolina Fence Garden. Um, you know, a lot of people will, will get there, uh, will get a handful of uh, people from their community and they'll um, kind of come together financially and, and create a Carolina Fence Garden. Um, schoolyard Habitat, a lot of our schools in South Carolina, um, they, they don't really have too much funding, especially to make a garden uh, for wildlife. So uh, come together in your community, maybe pick a school or two and uh, you know, combine your funds and um, support a schoolyard habitat project and get it certified. Um, and then again, certify your own yard uh, or your community or both uh, with National Wildlife Federation. Um, how do we spread the love for nature? Uh, talk, uh, talk about it with friends and family um, and make it fun. Um, and just remember to be kind. I, I've said this before, but a lot of people that are into nature and into the environment, um, you know, with all the development and people detached and, and caring more about, you know, their, their next Netflix binge or, uh, you know, their next uh, baseball tournament, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to get frustrated. But, you know, if you, if you go into it with a, with a negative attitude, I don't, I don't think people are really going to be, uh, uh, you know, attracting people to, to take a closer look at nature. So, you know, um, be, be conscious of, of, of how you're talking to people about it and, um, you know, be positive if, if you can. Um, and read Bringing Nature Home uh, by Douglas Ptolemy. Um, I've read it twice and I'll read it again. Uh, it's a fantastic book and I guarantee you once you, once you read it, you won't, you won't uh, garden the same. Um, you have a wood duck here, you have an indigo bunting, beautiful, beautiful uh, bird, and then a nice garter snake. Remember, garter snake, that's, that's gonna be food for a lot of things out there. Um, and that's one of the snakes that we found yesterday. Um, so challenges that wildlife face. Uh, window strikes, obviously I'm talking about birds here, but hundreds of millions of birds die each year due to, due to uh, um, window strikes. Domestic cats, uh, not just birds, um, but billions, billions of animals are killed by cats each year. Um, habitat loss and fragmentation. Remember the, the picture you know, at, the, at the beginning of this. You know, you, this used to be you know, one complete you know, ecosystem and, and habitat, and now look at all the fragmentation there. So uh, thinking about ways to, um, uh, to, to fix that. Um, and then climate change. So new studies show some species are changing their nesting period in response to temperature change. This could be dangerous if it leads to mismatches in the abundance of caterpillars and other food sources. Um, so just, you know, do, do some research, learn more about that uh, whenever you can. And, and again, if you ever have questions, um, please reach out to us. And the final slide here is just a little bit more about us. We were founded in 1931, so uh, almost our 90th birthday, you know, coming up. Um, it was founded by sportsmen, for sportsmen, but now we uh, obviously, uh, since I, I do a lot of talking about birds, we uh, get into to birders, uh, hikers, anybody that loves the outdoors or, um, you know, the animals within it. Um, and the donations that we receive uh, stay here in South Carolina. So if you decide to uh, donate to us, you know, we're going to use that money for trash pickups. We're going to use that money to reach more uh, children in schools and in, and in churches and libraries. Uh, we're going to use that money to um, install, you know, um, uh, bird boxes for something like a prothonotary warbler, where we've installed almost 230 bird boxes over the last year and a half, you know, for that declining species. 
um, we're going to use that money for advocacy. So, you know, think about, you know, if you're not already a supporter of ours, think about it. Um, so we can uh, reach more South Carolinians and, and, and help our, our awesome wildlife. Um, so I'm going to stay on with Shannon a little bit longer and answer any questions, but if anybody needs to, to leave, I know we're right at the hour now you can do so. And I'll let kind of Shannon, uh, uh, talk now. All right. So if you've got any more questions, go ahead and pop those into the comment box. Um, a great question from Greg. He wanted to know if you could talk about the importance of plant layering in backyard landscapes. Um, yeah, absolutely. You're probably going to uh, use the term understory, but I, I'm guessing that we've got a couple people who don't know what that means. So if you could explain that one as well. Yeah, so let's look at this this layered picture right here, or, or a picture of a, of a layered property. Um, you can see that there's one layer at the, the, the picture in the top, top left, right? Um, you know, you might be able to put a uh, bluebird box up and, and attract a bluebird. It, there might be enough food um, there, you know, uh, in the form of spiders and some other insects, you know, to, to sustain that. But other than that, you, you don't have any other layers. Um, so, you know, you're going to be really limited on, on the wildlife that you're going to support. But then look at the picture on the bottom left. You do have that turf grass, which is great for certain, certain species, um, assuming that you don't use pesticides or herbicides, um, but you'll get northern flickers there. It's a, it's a place that snakes can, you know, easily cross. Um, you know, turtles obviously could, could walk there. Think about it. Eastern box turtle. So I'm not a uh, hundred percent opposed to turf grass. I have some in, in, on our property, um, and we enjoy it. Um, and, uh, there is some benefit to having it for wildlife, but then, you know, you look at the, the next layer up and there's, there, there are grasses and perennials that are a little bit higher. So, you know, let's just say that they're, you know, a couple feet high. So that's the next layer. Well, look deeper into that picture further back and you start seeing, you start, you're starting to see some, some shrubs, some, uh, some low shrubs, you know, some relatively large bushes here. So there's another layer, okay? And maybe those layers are supporting, you know, uh, some, some reptiles and some amphibians that this layer here didn't, okay? Um, those layers are also going to support, you know, certain type of bird species. And I didn't even mention with this grassy layer here, the tall grassy, you know, you're probably going to be supporting blue grosbeaks. Uh, you're probably going to be supporting uh, indigo buntings in certain areas in South Carolina, maybe some painted buntings. Um, maybe not, you know, breeding, you know, in your yard, uh, depending on the size, but during migration, you're, you're offering, you're providing habitat for, for at least a day or two for it to forage in. Um, so you have uh, the turf grass, then the tall grasses, then the shrubs, and then you have, let's just say, medium trees here, okay, medium to small, and then you have, you know, medium to large, and then you have your, your large uh, trees here. So each of those um, provide, you know, a different layer um, in, in height, and each, each layer, you know, um, supports different species. Um, you think about a, a rough green snake, they can forage as high as 60, 60 plus feet, you know, in, in a tree. And think of then about a Mississippi kite swooping down and grabbing that, you know, green snake from the tree. Um, so, you know, layers are fantastic. I mean, just, just look at this one up here on the top left. One layer, um, to me, it's kind of boring. Um, but then look at the one on the bottom left, you know, multiple layers. It's visually more appealing, I would imagine, to 100% of us that are looking at it right now. Um, but not only is it, you know, visually appealing, but boy, are you going to support a lot of wildlife because of those, that, that multi-layered, you know, approach. Awesome. Um, we've got a lot of great comments happening. If anybody else has a question, go ahead and pop it into the comment box. Um, oh, what is a safe way to eliminate poison ivy? <laughs> Wear gloves. <laughs> That's you, you know what? I had poison ivy so bad in the second grade, I can only wear one shoe to school. <laughs> oh, because my foot was so swollen. Um, uh, I mean, if you have a, if you have a friend that's, you know, not allergic, <laughs> um, I don't know if there is a safe way. I, I'd hate to say use Roundup, you know, and, uh, but 
Um, I don't know, maybe as a, um, I, yeah, I just hate to say that, but uh, that wear gloves, you cover up and, and uh, you know, throw it to the side, don't burn it uh, because you could inhale it and that's not good. Um, but you know, there are people that aren't allergic and you might, you might actually know one and, uh, maybe see if he or she will, will help you with it. Uh, depending on the size. I mean, if it's just a couple plants, just wear gloves, pull them up, but you know, some, if you might be dealing with, you know, hundreds of plants and then, uh, you might have to get creative with it. Um, but I, I would definitely ask, ask around and see if there's anybody that's, um, you know, not, not allergic to it, to, to help you out or, or maybe just have a landscape company, um, and just pay them. It's, it's worth, it's worth maybe a hundred bucks to have somebody do it um, than to suffer for two weeks, <laughs> in my opinion. Let's see. There's another question about what's the best way to kill grass yard that won't hurt the environment while doing it? Best way to kill a grass yard? Yeah, Anna, um, if you, um, we might need a little more clarification on what specifically You mean there by grass yard? All right, here's a good question. What's the preferred mulch layer for weed control in planted areas? Pine straw, wood mulch, what are your questions? Yeah, depending on what you wanna do with it. Uh, you know, some people don't like, my wife being one of them, she doesn't really like pine straw. Uh, pine straw is great around blueberries, um, but uh, you know, mul mulch, they, there's a there's landscape companies out there that carry a lot of different varieties of mulch. Um, I always get the one that doesn't have any dye um, and it's just it's just natural. Um, and you you throw that down and it's good for a couple of years. Um, but you you know um, I'm always hesitant to you know put something you know that has dye unless it's you know naturally occurring or something like that. Um, so, uh, mulch is fantastic. Your leaves, uh, we were talking about leave the leaves. Um, you know, it, it might not be the most sightly thing, but if it's, if it's something that you can do, your leaves are fantastic, uh, to use, uh, as mulch to keep the weeds down. So pine straw is great. I like it. Um, you know, uh, mulch, uh, the just, just regular mulch that's just chipped wood, um, without any dyes or anything else in it, um, is fantastic and it looks really nice. And then, and then leaves are probably my, my top three go-to. Awesome. Um, let's see. Anna, if you want to send us an email about that, we can we can help you with some other resources regarding um, that full lawn underneath the forest growth. We can help you out with that if you give us a little more detail via email. Yeah, it sounds like a unique situation. I bet that. Yeah. It's looking like that's it for the comments. I did want to let people know that um, we do have a few more webinars scheduled. We are going to be repeating um, our webinar about bird migration. So if you are interested in learning more about the birds that have been coming through, some birds you might have seen in your yard, or even as you're driving down the road the last couple weeks, be sure mm -hmm. to sign up for that one. We also have a great um, guest speaker joining us for a presentation next week um, talking about um, alien invasion. So that's going to be mostly about invasive species and what that does to, to our habitat um, here in South Carolina and the ways that that can even change the environment. Um, so check out our website for those. We will be sending out a recording of this uh, presentation. And um, yeah, looks like so far we still don't have any more major questions. All right, well, I'm here, so just just email me and my emails. I should have had it on the on the um, presentation. I'll type it in for you. Okay. Comment yeah. J J A Y at S C W F dot O R G. So super easy. J A Y at S C W F dot O R G. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me. If you don't didn't get to them here. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right, guys. I enjoyed it. And I'll be signing off here. Uh, you know where to find me if you need me.